Hey folks, Coach Patrick here in Jersey Nation, back with another video cast, podcast action. Got the microphone rocking and rolling right here. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit today about um, Ironman Arizona 2019 for me. It was my 30th unbelievable, oh my goodness, scream emoji face um, performance. Um, and so pleased to have it end up in my favor with an age group win um, and another trip back to Kona for um, Kona number 11, YOLO Kona. Um, and I wanted to break down my report for you guys into three distinct sections. And I know you're thinking, you're like, oh great, here we go, swim, bike, run. Patrick's no good at swimming and he loves to bike and the run he survives. No, uh, I want to talk a little bit about it from a macro perspective today. Um, maybe try and slice it a little differently and kind of give you a bit of different insight. So I'm going to start with the buildup. Uh, next podcast will be uh, the race itself. And the third podcast will be lessons learned. Okay, so... Um, and each one is designed to be sort of a little more compressed so you get some sense of, of how things operate inside my space. Um, and hopefully you can glean some tips for yourself, uh, you know, for athletes of all abilities. At the end of the day, um, I'm really not, not much of a better athlete than you, the listener. I've just done this a lot, right? So like you look at someone who's like, God, that, you know, that actor, he's amazing. She's incredible up there on stage. Well, she failed like a million times before you saw her. Um, I also have failed a million times before my race in Arizona. So uh, to be honest, um, a lot of what I do when I race and when I put together plans for the season is simply trying not to fail. Like just starting off with don't fail. Um, and I know it sounds contrite, but the truth be told, I approach every single season and every single race as an opportunity to both improve on what I did before. Um, and I definitely operate from a space of fear, a space of you know being um, not fit enough on race day, not healthy enough on race day, not mentally capable of being able to do what I want to do on race day. Um, I come in with a, with very low expectations. I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, I am not the person who um, uh, has deep internal confidence upon which I rely to perform well. Uh, and you just take one look at my Strava feed, and you'll see that I clearly do a fair amount of training to compensate for a distinct lack of confidence in myself. Um, and I think that's that's an important um, aspect to being successful at endurance sports is a very realistic appreciation of your abilities and understanding that any race day could be anything. You could have a great race, you could have a bad race, and many of those things are out of your control. Um, and that, you know, luck favors the prepared, to say it in, a, in the simplest way possible. Um, and for me, leadership on race day comes from daily discipline um, and execution with workouts. Um, if you want to be excellent on race day, if you tell me your goals as an athlete, a part of endurance nation, you tell me your goals are to reach a certain level or hit a certain time, then I expect to see compliance on the workout side that corresponds with it. I'm not saying you have to also be a sub three hour runner or you also have to be someone who can, you know, bike 17 hours a day uh, or, or be genetically gifted. No, I'm just saying that you get the workouts done. You know, there's 24 hours in a day. And if you have goals that are specific to you and your endurance uh, world, your endurance mindset, your endurance um, personality, then you should be doing the work to achieve it. Just like if you want to learn a foreign language, you should be practicing the language. You should be studying the language. If you want to get good at juggling like that famous uh, actor or whatever, you have to juggle, you have to practice. Um, and if you're not doing it, then the odds of you being successful when the rubber meets the road, pretty darn slim, right? Okay, so thinking about this year, let's step back and just keep it in context. I only raced uh, two triathlons this year. I raced Kona and I raced Arizona. Um, that's by design. Um, the past couple of years, I have done Kona and a follow-up Ironman to qualify again, effectively putting together two races. The idea behind that is that um, you get a chance to do one big training build um, and you use that fitness twice in a short period of time. Is it for everybody? No. Doing two races back to back, is it easy? No, um, but it's possible. Um, and for people who have the bandwidth to train, like I do, um, who can race uh, within themselves and within their abilities, which I am very capable of doing, um, and then are able to somehow continue training, even though you just raced, which I love training, so not a problem, we're pretty good. Um, you know, some people have you know insane jobs, insane commitments, carry a great deal of stress on top of everything else that they do inside their endurance space. That makes it a lot harder. But I say from a macro perspective, before we get into your personal details, the ability to take one build and make it count twice for the season is great. Otherwise, it means, you know, train, 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 build, 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 peak, race, then recover, go all the way back down again, and then train, 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 build, 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 and maybe be, you know, 2% better than you were last time. Uh, well, if we can keep that same build right now, um, we can get two bangs for one buck, right, which is ultimately what we want. 
So um, that was my intent this year. And so when I set out, having done this twice before, the first by accident, last year by intent, uh, the last two years I'd done them in warm races. I did them in Cabo first, the last Ironman in Cabo. Then the year after that, which was just last year, I did it in Cozumel. Really loved Cozumel. Got to go check that race out. Also hot, also windy, although not so bad after coming off of Hawaii. Um, and this year was going to be Arizona, so a lot cooler, different weather, and actually another week. So kind of took it out to six weeks, which I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, and so when you think about planning your season for a full year, there's a lot of work. Almost you know January to July for me is training and preparing, building volume, doing camps, um, baseline stuff on the run, but lots of cycling, lots of cycling volume. That's great. In July, I start swimming again. I start getting into more tri mode. Uh, July, August, and September are kind of the peak months. August and September, peak, peak months for the bike run and even the swim at the very, very end. And I go into Kona. I'm not massively peaked by the time I hit Kona. Um, and uh, that's because I know I have to continue, sort of maintain that fitness across to my next race. So I'm in years past, I've gone, you know, mega big for Kona, like huge training stress, huge big workouts, etc. Barely surviving October to get from the 1st of October to the 10th or the 11th or the 12th or whatever races, um, and then racing and then just literally collapsing for a month before I rejuvenate myself. Um, now I've come to a place, I'm definitely older, 45, 49 age group right now, um, where I realized that I can't, while I can do that super high end work, the cost associated with it and the time needed to recover are so great that it's actually detrimental to my overall trajectory as an endurance athlete. So I don't want to get too caught up in that. So what I try and do is divide my year up. So let me talk a little bit about those specifics for you guys. First and foremost, for me, it's all about the bike. We talk about the bike inside Endurance Nation. Cannot say enough. It's the longest leg of the race. A 5% improvement on 112 miles is significantly greater than a 5% improvement on the swim. Right? I'm just saying, it's like straight up, that's just where it's at. Speed is found on the bike. Um, and we make, we make you a faster athlete by sorting out that bike first. Now, if 5% difference on the swim means you hanging on a paddleboard, like praying for like, you know, some winged angel to pick you out of the water because you think you're gonna drown and actually completing the swim, then by all means, we want you to swim more. But in general, macro level stuff, it's all about the bike. There's bike fitness that needs to be added, which takes time. There's bike skill handling. Uh, there's bike equipment selection and equipment dialing in, like your bike fit, aero position. Um, then there's finally um, how to ride your bike on race day. So there's multiple components that we have to solve as an athlete to be successful in the context of an Ironman. Now, if you're doing different sports, you have different contextual elements you need to solve. But since I'm talking about Arizona and my season, I'm going to talk specifically about Ironman. So there's specific things that we need to solve. Um, and so for me, um, I already know how to handle my bike-ish. Right? Well, at least I've stopped crashing the past couple of years. Um, I already know how to ride my bike in the context of an Ironman from a physical standpoint, handling hills, descents, etc., pacing. Um, so for me, a great deal of what I'm trying to solve now as I've worked across the years is really focusing on my fitness. How can I build uh, continued bike fitness and then sustain that fitness across a year? Not, not build something and just carry it all year, but build a level of baseline fitness that I can bring into the center of my year. And then in the center of the year, get really, really specific. Where are my gaps in my fitness? What's missing? What do I need to add? And that's what January, sorry, July and August are for. Identifying those gaps and saying, what do I do? By that point in time, I'm already riding 200, 250, or 300 miles a week. Um, I usually do one or two longer rides, uh, like a 150 mile ride, and then even a 200 mile, 10 hour ride on my tri bike. It's a two, yeah, it's, it's 10, you know, it's 200 miles, but it's on my tri bike. It's kind of cheating. Um, and I spend a fair amount of time on the bike early in the year with training camps, etc. Um, and then so when it comes in time to be race prep and the run volume has started to come up, I get way more specific with what I'm trying to do on the bike. So the volume is still there. I'm still doing 200, 250 miles a week, but the quality goes up relative to what I'm trying to achieve on race day. So I do plenty of work on Zwift, as those of you who know me and follow me online are all about. Uh, I do plenty of racing, plenty of riding on Zwift, and it seems like I do intensity all the time or I'm riding all the time. But in general, I'm just riding as to how I feel. I've got a general volume goal in the off season in terms of what I wanna do and a fun goal, of course, wanna have fun. Um, but when I get in season, when I hit that last three months, like we talked about inside the station last 12 weeks, it's all about specificity and filling in those gaps. So my training in July and August is really built towards what I want to do in Kona relative to the bike. And of course, like any other Ironman course, the bike course in Kona is very bike dominant, um, primarily by the weather. So you never know what you're going to get. Some years, fast years, some years, not so fast years on the bike. 
um, but always challenging. It's 112 miles on the bike. And that bike and your bike performance is what sets up the rest of your day on the run. So a fair amount of biking. Uh, on the swim side of things, I always start off with the Vasa. And generally speaking, it tends to be um, April, May, I kind of get back into it slowly using the Vasa as my re-entry tool and then get stronger. Mid-year, I'll add a couple open water swims for fun, but I don't really start hitting the lap pool until July and August. Uh, and I think that's going to have to change this year. Um, uh, if I want to be more successful, more competitive at Hawaii, I'm going to need a better swim. I don't think it's out of reach. I don't think I need to do more swimming in any specific week. I just need to expand the window of swimming that I have. So I'll be doing that in the future, but I want to get away from podcast number three in the series. So um, I'll keep it kind of on the down low there. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm definitely going to start swimming a little bit sooner in that regard. The running is always there. The running, I start right back up again about a month after my last race of the year. I like to give my body time to heal from the running. And I like to keep a general baseline level of running 15 to 20 miles a week for fun. Uh, keep it rolling. Uh, if weather's great on the weekend, I may run longer. I may not. But generally speaking, very low level volume um, overall in the winter, just low pressure volume. Um, I try and get my workouts done Monday through Saturday. Uh, Sundays tend to be a swing day or off day. If we happen to be away for um, a ski trip once in a while or I have some other commitment like the holidays, I don't stress. I used to stress, used to bring everything with me and train. Now I just kind of chill um, and uh, try and keep the general volume going. I'll try and get more cycling volume in earlier in the week if I'm going away um, or I'll do more run volume when I am away on the road because running is easy. Uh, but in general, the early part of the season, the bulk of my season is spent um, building fluency, uh, and building volume, building consistency, uh, and building that kind of durability. Um, I take advantage of opportunities to race on Zwift, but I don't do a lot of in-season races. In the past, I've done um, plenty of half marathons in the course of a season, um, but I haven't done a 70.3 in years. Um, and so uh, it's definitely, you know, sort of one of the things where I know where my niche is. I know what I enjoy doing. I know what I enjoy racing. I put a lot of time and energy into that. Um, and so all the work sort of revolves around that. And for us inside Endure Station, we've solved for this equation over time. And it's pretty clear that volume and sustained volume across time done manageably on a schedule that fits your life that's got very low cost is actually incredibly effective. Uh, winter period of time, just as another side note, it's a very short period of time for me, uh, really just sort of December-ish because I race at the end of November, but really December is January. -ish. I'll go back to the gym. I'll do some body strength exercises. Um, I'll definitely fire up a push-up challenge here at home, uh, building myself up to 100 push-ups. Um, but generally speaking, I'm not doing deadlifts. I'm not doing anything crazy. Um, we, as long as you're healthy inside Endurance Station, we focus specifically on working hard in your discipline of choice, swimming hard, biking hard, running hard at specific periods of the time of year, using intensity as a tool to make you fitter. Um, I'd much rather have you bike hard than go lift weight so you could bike hard, right? I don't want to send you to the gym to change into gym shorts to find a locker or stand next to someone else in an awkward manner because you only two people in the locker room and you're all next to each other to go downstairs to argue over weights and a bench to lift them up and down to get good at cycling when your trainer is in the pain cave in the basement and you can just hop your leg over it and pedal for 30, 40 minutes, only have 40 minutes of training and life is good. Right. Uh, as we age, strength and uh, you know, sort of overall wellness becomes a larger concern. But generally speaking, it's all about the functional work. And we definitely emphasize that. And you'll see that in my season. Um, and I'll put some links up for you guys as well to my Strava profile. Um, so you can see some of the uh, charts that come from my race report. I'll link that here as well so you can see that. In general, I want you to take a look at sort of the, the bigger macro progression across the year. Across the year. Um, for the swim, the bike, and the run, there'll be three independent charts so you kind of get a sense of where things go. Um, in the next episode, I will be back and I'll be talking a little bit more about speci specificity of um, the peak period and how that applies to the race itself. That's a very key element that's lost um, for athletes as they think about being Ironman athletes. They think about doing race-specific training or race-specific volume all year. Don't get me wrong, I do a fair amount of volume. I love training, but I'm not doing race-specific volume. I'm having a lot of time on the bike. I'm having fun time running and doing some other cross-training work, um, but it's not the same type of work as, as I do when I'm race-specific. And I think it's a very important separation to have as an athlete. Okay, guys, thanks so much for tuning in for this introductory, technically part one of a three-part series on my 2019 performance, which led to winning my age group at Ironman Arizona by mere 40 seconds, maybe-ish, um, and uh, a great experience overall with the team and pointing towards my 11th Kona. I'll be back in the next installment talking a little bit about that peak period and also talking about the race performance itself. Um, stay tuned. Some fun stories in there. Um, hopefully, all suitable language, of course, for the kiddos, because why? You're in the car. Kids are listening, right? Thanks, folks. Stay tuned. I'll be back with more. This is Coach Patrick signing off. Bye now.